let's talk mobile broadband. Previously, I touched on how 2G data was originally carried over circuit switch channels that weren't ideal for data. GPRS and Edge introduced a packetized data channel to 2G that allowed data up to 171 kilobits per second and 384 kilobits per second respectively. But it wasn't until 3G that we finally saw a native packetized data channel and the true start of mobile broadband. The ITU defines a 3G network as one that delivers data services at transmission rates of at least 144 kilobits per second in mobile or moving environments, and at least two megabits per second in fixed indoor environments. Much like 2G, 3G actually had two dominant variations. In North America and South Korea, 3G followed on from CDMA1 with CDMA2000, defined by the 3GPP2. Everywhere else, the 3GPP defined Universal Mobile Telecommunication Service, based on wideband CDMA. Both systems met the ITU's requirements of true 3G systems. Throughout the 90s and early 2000s, we saw enhancements to 3G on both sides of the ocean. The 3GPP2 defined Evolution Data Optimized, or EVDO, Release Zero, and Revision A to increase CDMA 2000's initial data throughput from 144 kilobits per second to 2.4 megabits per second and 3.1 megabits per second. Meanwhile, the 3GPP defined High Speed Packet Access, or HSPA, and HSPA Plus to increase UMTS's initial data throughput from 384 kilobits per second to 14.4 megabits per second and 28 megabits per second. And even newer flavors of HSPA Plus using multiple input and multiple output antennas, or MIMO, and higher order modulation can reach 42 megabits per second in the downlink using a single 5 megahertz carrier. Multiple carriers can be aggregated together to allow speeds as high as 168 megabits per second for four carriers. Great, so what's a carrier? A carrier is a chunk of bandwidth assigned to an operator to allow use of a mobile site or technology. In 3G, Carriers are fixed at 5 gigahertz spacings to limit interference between operators. For UMTS, a carrier uses 3.8 megahertz. And with CDMA 2000, a carrier uses 3.75 megahertz. The remainder is split on both sides and used as guard bands to minimize interference. Kind of like a cushion or pillow between you and your sister when riding in the backseat of the car to make sure you don't cross boundaries. Carrier aggregation is also called dual cell in the context of UMTS or HSPA+. In release 8, through carrier aggregation, part of the UMTS extension to HSPA+, two downlink carriers may be assigned to one user. Release 10 supports four carrier aggregation and eight carrier aggregation is supported in release 11. 3GPP standardized carrier aggregation for HSPA+, for the uplink, with two component carriers since release 9. But carrier aggregation isn't only dependent on the mobile network. Many smartphones at the time simply didn't support more than one carrier, and those that did typically limited it to two carriers. To get the full bandwidth of four carriers or more, devices like 3G routers and dongles typically need to be used. And this actually makes sense, since it's very unlikely a single mobile phone would need that level of bandwidth. December 14, 2009, the first 4G network was deployed, and what set 4G apart from 3G was that it was the first all-IP mobile site or technology. Previous generations all used proprietary interfaces and a combination of circuit and packet switching for voice and data. 4G, in addition to eliminating circuit switching altogether, adopted IP for all interfaces to allow for more flexible configuration and more fully embrace the data-centric world. Three systems were proposed as meeting the 4G requirements. Long-Term Evolution, LTE, Ultra Mobile Broadband, UMB, and Worldwide Interoperability for Microwave Access, or WiMAX. All three offered higher efficiency air interfaces using OFDM, or Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplex. Variable channel sizes up to 20 megahertz, 
and they eliminated the circuit switch channel for voice and provided all IP connectivity between elements. The short-lived Ultra Mobile Broadband became the official name of CDMA 2000 EBDO Revision C and offered a variable channel size from 1.25 to 20 megahertz, but it died in November of 2008. WiMAX was defined by the IEEE, the guys that brought us Wi-Fi, and was an attempt to bring Wi-Fi functionality to mobile networks. Defined by the WiMAX forum as a standards-based technology enabling the delivery of last mile wireless broadband access as an alternative to cable and DSL. A variant defined under 802.16M was intended as a direct competitor to LTE Advanced, but didn't survive long enough to see deployment. Of the two that saw commercial deployment, LTE and WiMAX were split based on how they were used rather than being split regionally like CDMA 2000 and UMTS. LTE was much better suited to mobile devices where mobility and roaming were key. WiMAX was better suited as a wireless replacement to DSL and fiber to the home for internet access, or what we now call fixed wireless access. Interestingly, neither LTE nor WiMAX could actually meet the ITU's 4G specifications. But many operators called it 4G anyway. The original specification for 4G, called IMT Advanced, required 100 megabits per second for highly mobile communication, like driving a car, and one gigabit per second for low mobility communication, like walking or sitting. LTE has a theoretical bandwidth of 100 megabits per second in the downlink and 50 megabits per second in the uplink, using a 20 megahertz channel. Similarly, WiMAX has a theoretical bandwidth of 128 megabits per second in a 20 megahertz channel. Both can be increased by using multiple input and multiple output antennas or aggregating multiple carriers together. But remember, 3G uses a 5 MHz channel, and if we aggregate 4 together to give us 20 MHz, we can actually reach 168 Mbps per second with HSPA Plus and MIMO. You can see why some operators might be upset if some were allowed to market LTE as 4G when a 3G provider with a faster network couldn't. There were even court cases in which operators were forced to use 3.9G or 3.95G to market their LTE or WiMAX networks, and rightfully so. Eventually, the International Telecommunications Union for Radio Communication, or ITUR, recognized that both WiMAX and LTE, as well as other beyond 3G technologies, could be considered 4G because they represented what was, according to them, a substantial level of improvement in performance and capabilities with respect to the initial third generation systems now deployed. Subsequent enhancements to LTE and WiMAX, including LTE Advanced, LTE Advanced Pro, and WiMAX 2 did eventually meet the official specifications of 4G and continue to be deployed today. Well, not so much WiMAX anyway. And they are the stepping stones to the much larger data-centric world of connectivity that extends our internet of smartphones and laptops to the internet of things. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the future.